Hi, I'm Tony Mejia. If you're new, a lifer, still trying to figure all of this out, we're so glad that you are here with us today. Ever been like, I'm so glad things worked out? My Earlier this week, my dad showed me that he found a wallet and he's returning it back to the person. It had the money and all the ID, and I'm just thinking, God bless you. You know, that very day, you know, I was driving with my family, we did what we needed to do, and as I was driving back, I started thinking, where's my wallet? You know, I looked down and it's not where I normally put it. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe it fell through, you know, it's probably under my chair. And so we get home and I check and my wallet is gone. So immediately I'm like, it has to be at that parking lot. So I drop my family off and I rush over safely to the parking lot. And as I, you know, as I'm going there, I'm thinking, okay, you know, it's probably not going to be there. I'm sort of, you know, thinking frantically like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll get this online. I'll do this. You know, it'll be fine. I'll lose out on this. I, oh, I have to do this. I'm thinking of all these things. And as I get to the parking lot, I look at the spot that we were in and there's a car there. So I look right under and I see one of my cards. And I see that the person actually parked on top of my wallet. And now my wallet has some awesome tire marks in it. But I thank God that all of my stuff was there and the person didn't see and ran it over and I have all my ID. See, it's great when things work out and it's so awesome when we praise God. But when we're in the process, when we are in the verge of things, it gets very very hectic and frantic and where we need the peace of God, where we need Jesus. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And today we're going to see some real people with some real problems, but with some real power and a real God in Mark 5 verses 24 to 34. So let's begin. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him or crowded him or, you know, packed around him. See, this sets the scene for things. People started crowding Jesus. A great crowd could be thousands and thousands and thousands of people. See, Jesus is there with his disciples and the father who has a daughter who's at the point of death. And Jesus said that he was with him and they were journeying towards his daughter. But this crowd is big and it's all around and we know that something is about to happen. And we see that in verse 25 to 26. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. This poor lady has suffered for a long time, 12 years, she tried everything. She exhausted everything, all her resources, everything. You know, um, another gospel account says that she went to the religious leaders, she went to this person, these physicians, you know, in the Talmud, their, their oral tradition, there was some strange things that, you know, might have helped like putting a peacock uh, feather over your head and walking around and hoping that someone would scare you and that would help you with your blood issue. You know, there was other things like boiling three onions from Persia in wine and drinking that. That may help. There's also this other one that says, you know, taking a, making a necklace out of corn. But this corn had to be found in dung of a white donkey. How people figured this out, I don't know, but it did not work for this lady. But when you are desperate, you're desperate. See, we can laugh at those things, but when you're desperate, you are desperate. I remember one uh, summer, you know, there's a um, heat wave and my wife and I, all that we could afford was this little fan. And what we did was we took that fan everywhere with us. If we were in the living room, it was in the living room with us. If we were in the kitchen, it was in the kitchen with us. You, you get the point. 
But when you're desperate, you're desperate. And we had that little fan and it helped us and we still have it part of our family today. See, this woman suffered alone for 12 years. And according to the time, she's unclean, she's an outcast, she's not allowed to enter into the public, nor have friends or family around her. She's not allowed to have her sins taken care of in the temple. She's not allowed in the temple to worship even in a little corner. She wasn't able to pray in community. She wasn't able to practice her faith. Nobody is with her. Nobody knew her anymore and nobody could really care about her. She worshiped and prayed alone, but she heard something. And we hear that and we see that in verse 27. And she had heard the reports about Jesus. Reports went out to the outsiders or maybe the outsiders were mingling in the crowd, but hope began to fill their homes. Everything was going to change for them, they hoped. And this is what the verse continues with. And she came up behind Jesus in the crowd and touched his garment. You understand, she would have to go through thousands and thousands of people if she's in the outskirts to get to Jesus. But she makes her way and stretches out and touches Jesus' garment. It says, and we get a little more insight of her thinking in verse 28. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. She was fed up with her life. She heard of Jesus and the good news that Jesus um, comes with. And she was just fed up. She tried everything. She exhausted everything. And she was at the point of being so fed up. And you may be at that point. You may have those points in your life where you are so fed up. And usually you only get two options here. One option is you complain about it and continue to live in that. You know, what you're fed up with. Or you can stretch out and allow Jesus to change your life life. And that's what happens with this lady in verse 29. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. All the energy that she spent, all the resources that she spent, all the uh, false hope that she spent, everything that she spent didn't even compare to the one very moment and second in time that she had with Jesus. And Jesus didn't even break a sweat. That's the kind of power that we speak of. That's the power that we sing about. That's actually the power that lives in us through the Holy Spirit. You know, we've seen him throughout Mark casting out um, demons. We've seen him calm down storms. We see him freeing people. And now we're seeing him heal people. What I love about Jesus is he makes himself available. Jesus makes himself available to you and I. You know, wherever we are, he makes himself available. He walked through that crowd going in that specific direction towards that man's uh, daughter. But that was where he had that opportunity where she had the opportunity to encounter Jesus. And you may be at home, you may be in certain spots of your life where you're fed up or you're in these moments and Jesus makes himself available to you where you are. Sometimes it seems like he's just gonna pass by, but that passing by is for you to see that he is available, that power is available for you. And he wants to make himself available to you. And this is what we read when she touches him. She's healed. There's this moment that happens. And it's a moment why I really love Mark. Because you get these little details. In verse 30 to 32. And Jesus perceived in himself that power had gone out from him. And immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And the disciples said to him, Well, uh, you see the crowds pressing around you, yet you say, Who touched me? And Jesus looked around to see who had done it. 
to the disciples. They're a bunch of Captain Obviouses. They didn't pick up what Jesus was saying. You know, they were trying to give some insightful details here. But really what Jesus is doing is giving a rhetorical question. If you think about the setting in this time, people are crowding, people are there. Jesus stops. So thousands of people are stopping and they're listening to every word that Jesus says. And Jesus says, who touched my garments? Jesus is giving a platform and opportunity for this woman. For this woman to take her faith public. See, people would notice this lady because they knew that she was unclean, unworthy, unwanted, and unwelcome. She suffered alone for so long. She was in isolation for so long. She's filled with great, uh, grief and shame. She tried everything and nothing worked but made things even worse. But she's in this time, a period of time in her life where Jesus' power has transformed her and she can resume living in this new normal, in this life that Jesus has now provided for her. But the thing is, she could have been arrested for even being in that crowd. She could have been put on trial for just being in that crowd. She could have even been killed because out of fear, she was not allowed to be in that crowd. Which brings us to verse 33. But the woman, knowing what, she, what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. I feel so bad for this lady in this moment. She finally gets the healing that she needs in the miracle. And then she's just like, Jesus, this is what happened. Like, how long would it take you to tell the whole truth? See, my son is a lot like his mother and they have very guilty conscience about things. So when they're trying to tell the truth, They'll go on and on and on. And that's kind of how I picture this lady in this moment. Is she's just going off about the truth. And she's saying all these things to Jesus. And Jesus embraces her and says these amazing words in verse 34. And Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Even in the middle of the crowd, even in the middle of her fear, Jesus was not too busy for her. See, he doesn't become unclean because she touches him. Uh, Jesus doesn't even shame her, but he removes her shame. He removes, um, you know, and cleanses her. That's the changing power of Jesus that was released in her life and would transform her forever in this just amazing mo moment in time. But the story did not begin with this woman. This was a detour. Because there, in that moment, Jesus with his disciples in the crowd and that ruler. And this is the news that the ruler gets in verse 35. And while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher? Why trouble Jesus any further? See, I can't even imagine this moment. And, and if you've ever lost a child or a loved one, I, I feel for you. Like this is such a hard moment in time and we cannot forget that this is a real story with real people and a real encounter with God. This would be heartbreaking. As Jesus is talking and celebrating with this lady and having this you know, platform, this beautiful moment, they say, to, uh, they say to the ruler, it's too late. Don't even bother with Jesus anymore. Don't bother him. Maybe you know, we were right that this Jesus thing wouldn't work out. And if I was the ruler, Jesus, how about me? I'm the point of the story, aren't I? See, my daughter is at the point of death. I'd be frustrated. I'd be impatient. And all that is happening. And this is what our final verse reads today. But over here, what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. Thing is, they don't have much in common, do they? The ruler and the woman. The ruler is wealthy. 
the woman spent everything she had to get healed. The ruler was able to love and had a daughter that he could love. This woman wasn't able to be loved or love anybody. We don't even know if she had family or even any children. This ruler was free to live and do what he wanted. And this woman, she was in the outskirts, abandoned and alone. But they were in the same boat. In the same boat that we're in. They need Jesus. See, one thing that really comes out over and over again is this. That that lady suffered for 12 years. And we know from other gospel accounts that this daughter, the ruler's daughter, is 12 years old. And what does Jesus call the woman that he heals? Daughter. Because he didn't just heal her, you know, uh, this physical healing, but it's also spiritual healing. This word healed here is both healing and salvation. Healing her from the inside out. And he doesn't just heal the physical. He heals the spiritual and brings her into a family. And Jesus is going to restore this man's family and bring them together. But in this moment in time, this woman needed to be brought into the family. And this is for us too. If we call on the name of Jesus, we are standing. We are the sons and daughters. We are the restored. We're these people who are in the process that Jesus is doing in our lives. And Jesus isn't too busy for you or I. He's not too busy to remove what we are fed up with in our lives. And this woman had to fight through the crowded area to stretch out to Jesus. This man had to fight the doubt and the fear that entered his life. You will fight for the peace and the healing and things in your life, but those are offered to us by Jesus and it's there and he is there for us. See, Jesus overhears what is said. And usually what happens is when it's not the truth and it's said and spoken to us with the doubt and the fear and, and all the shame, the guilt and things like that, it's to keep you in those places where you are fed up and you just go in the cycle. But you got to know the truth. And that's God's uh, delay is not God's denial. See, the ruler is believing, but fear is creeping in. But the ruler could see that Jesus can do a work, that Jesus does do a work. And the ruler didn't necessarily need to compare himself, but his faith could be built up because God's delay is not God's denial. The ruler could have compared. The ruler could have said, I understand, but really just try to disconnect himself from Jesus because it was over or in his mind over. The ruler could have been like, God, why not me? Why not my loved one? See, God will care for the both of them. He just helped the woman in need then and there. Trust me, she was overdue for her miracle. But Jesus crossed her path and needed to take care of her first at that moment. And he did not forget the ruler. He did not you know, not value the ruler at all in the situation and his daughter and all that. It's he was in the moment and he took care of that woman and he was still headed towards the daughter of the ruler. See, um, detours happen in our lives. And, uh, you know, as, as a church, we've been trying to take care of one another and, and connect. But there's one certain person that we've been trying to connect with. And people always ask me, have you connected with this person? It's like, we've tried, we've tried, we hope. And I was praying with one of the board members. And their prayer was, God, you know, may we come in contact with her so that we can know that she is okay. The very next day. I'm driving with my family somewhere and my wife says, let's turn down this street. 
I'm like, nah, we can just keep going straight. Oh, she's like, no, the next street, turn left. And I was like, oh, sure. So I turned, because I was not going to fight my wife. So I turn down the street, and guess who we see? The person that we were trying to contact. And there she is. So we do a Yui, go over, and we start talking to her. We're like, how are you? And we're able to meet her needs and, and, and kind of help her and, and told her things that are available and how we were there for her. But the thing is, she said something very significant. She said, I was wandering around and I was wondering, God, do you hear me? God, do you still hear me? Do you still love me? This doubt was creeping in her. And she said, because you came, I know that God hears me. I know God cares for me. I know God is with me. And that's the thing is, uh, that's the thing. We are the who had hads. I know we're the whosoever would believe. But we're also the who had hads. And that's what he says a lot in Mark. Mark says, you know, the man who had had demons. The woman who had had this abnormal uh, bleeding. We are the who had hads. We're the ones who God does a work in to encourage one another, to, you know, to come back and say, you know what, God, you did this work in me. You continue to do this work in me. I used to be in this place. A lot of you were in different spots in your life. You had had these issues, but God dealt with them. You had had these struggles, but you were celebrating the recovery of that. See, when we are on the verge of change, thoughts begin to contradict in you. Because that's the attack, that's the things that happen in you. And then you come to a place in time, this opportunity to believe in the truth. See, this woman heard the good news and she went to Jesus. The ruler heard the bad news and he was with Jesus. Jesus overheard their hearts, overheard the lies, and he spoke the truth to the both of them. And that's what he does. They were both stretched to believe the truth, but it was well worth it. We see that for the lady, and we'll soon see that for the man. See, when enough is enough, Jesus is enough to believe in. See, he's the one who causes the change. He's the one who causes the healing. He's the one who causes the reconciliation. He's the one who causes the hope that we need. We are the ones who are the had-hads. We had had these issues. We can believe in his word. We can believe in his work. We can believe that his delay is not his denial. Denial of the healing and work that he wants to do in us. We also need to come back to a place and always be reminded to allow others and their blessings to encourage us. To allow others and their victories to encourage us. To allow others and their miracles to encourage us. Where we're not just like, God, well, I'm waiting for mine. We're like, God, thank you that you did that for her. And you're still with me and in my journey. That woman got what she longed for and needed. And next week, we see what God has in store for the ruler. But before that, let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for this time that we gather together, Lord, around your word. And God, believing your word will stretch us. It will mature us. It's so hard for us sometimes to grasp it. But Lord, we just pray that we would grasp your word and that we would allow that stretching to mature us and to grow us and to trust you more. We thank you for the healing that you did through this woman, Lord, and that she wouldn't be alone, Lord, and helping us that we are not alone, but you are with us and you can do the work that you want to do in our lives. And God, we just pray that we would allow um, others to encourage us. When we see, let us celebrate what you're doing in their lives. Even when we do not see what we need or what we're hoping for or what you've spoken but hasn't come 
um, together yet, Lord. We know that you are good and that you are with us. So we thank you so much, Lord, that you are with us. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you've never called on the name of Jesus before, uh, please contact us and we would love to connect uh, with you. And if you know Jesus, then you know his saving power. And that saving power is in you too. So if you're new, a lifer, still trying to figure all of this out, we're so glad that you've joined us today. Much love.